So, ladies and gentlemen, it's a, it's a delight and a pleasure for me to introduce um, uh, the Minister of Training Colleges and Universities of the Province of Ontario, uh, of Ontario the Honourable Glenn Murray. Uh, for those of you who are following what is happening in the province of Ontario, you will know that there is a lot of exploration, discussion, and analysis of the higher education sector in Ontario, what it is now and where it is going. And I think it's fair to say that very, perhaps not much of that activity would be happening were it not for the energy, the enthusiasm, and the motivation and stimulus provided by the minister, Glenn Murray. He asks good questions. He listens when people talk. He assesses the evidence and isn't afraid to do the right thing to moving a sector as important as post-secondary education along. So please join me in welcoming the Honorable Glenn Murray. Thank you very much. I don't have a watch. That's like Mario Andretti without speed signs. Um, uh, so you, you, you'll give me five minute notice. Thank you. It's great. Uh, it's an occupational hazard. Um, I, I want to thank all of you for coming out, and I want to thank Harvey and, uh, and our friends at the Higher Education Quality Council of Ontario for the excellent work that they do. Um, <clears throat> it's been an interesting, well, it's not quite a year that I've been minister, uh, but it's been a very interesting voyage into a completely new culture. Um, and it is an interesting voyage uh, into how different life is inside our universities particularly to life outside of them, how extraordinarily different our colleges are from our universities, and how completely different what is happening in Ontario economically, socially, and in education, and the rest of the world. And it is extremely concerning. You know, th there are two, two sentences that were exchanged by very different people in the last 12 months that, to me, define the challenges of post-secondary education with a great deal of clarity. One was by a student who was a recent graduate of Ryerson who had started his own company and was making an extraordinary amount of money. A matter of fact, his products are so good that if you go to my website and what I and my city, two city councillors are doing on a community conversation around neighbourhood planning and need, trying to understand the health needs and how do we better define service, this young fellow has developed something called Soapbox, uh, which is now used by major book retailers as well as a way to connect with cu customers, create policy, dialogues or run a book club. It's an extraordinary... And when asked what the most important thing was, he said, about his education, he said here at Ryerson, and he named the president, Sheldon Levy, trusted me to learn. Trusted me to learn. Did I feel that my university trusted me to learn when I went to university? No. No, my university knew it all. And I, like every 18 or 19 year old, thought I knew it all. Some would suggest that may not have changed much. But I decided that uh, city building was all about engineering and the values of engineering and economics of land use, structures and design. That we were building a but ugly country and that as James Howard Kunstler said, when every place starts to look the same, there's no such thing as place anymore. Or that, you know, we had the, what Oscar Wilde referred to as people who know the price of everything and the value of nothing were running many of our institutions and our libraries and great public institutions were looking like fertilizer factories. And in my previous life, I was mayor of a city where those values, completely utilitarian, dumbed down, ugly, stretched tax dollars till they break, values had taken over and young people were living because we disinvested in culture and we disinvested in quality of life. I always remember when I was mayor, we always did a survey in the fall about what do you love about your city? And they always said the arts, the park, the ballet, the heritage buildings, our libraries, that. And then when we did the budget, we asked, well, what do you want to cut back? What don't you? Well, we want to keep policing, more potholes and fix leaky pipes. Where do we save money? We'll cut grants to the ballet, you know, 
privatize the parks, you know, sell off, uh, cancel the heritage building programs, and that. The very things that are the determinants of a successful regional economy are the things that when you get into a completely fiscal automaton role, which governments get into very popularly, they tend to shade, shed away all the things that they think are essential, that, that they think are, 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 are superfluous and protect what they think are essential. So I got interested in that and I took engineering courses. But we didn't have online education because I'm an ancient one. And I got no credit for it and I learned a heck of a lot. Matter of fact, when I became mayor, and then in my current life uh, as a downtown, as the MPP in central Toronto, uh, the idea of the built environment, the value, transportation structures, the coherence of our urban environment, the aesthetics of it, are really, really important things. And if you don't understand how engineers think, you can't work with them. And what I really learned about was the values and attitudes about civil engineers and the culture around civil engineering, what they value and don't value, and why our cities, our places, and our buildings look so much. So one of the things that we did was we had a public works as public arts project and put architects and, and artists in charge of every major public work and building. All of a sudden, things started looking beautiful. As a matter of fact, engineers started cross-fertilizing and all kinds of wonderful things happened. But that judgment, which took me through seven courses and no credits, was probably the most valuable part of my education. Then I was told I would amount to nothing and become a failure, so I better leave university. Um, I would probably be a really good student today. Because I would do that. I could, go, I could take engineering and architecture courses online for free at some of the best institutions. I have more access at my fingertips to learn. And I would be in an environment that if I went to Ryerson or I went to Trent or some of those universities, I would probably be trusted to learn. And the institution would provide the discipline and the critical evaluations of work, set courses of study, relate competencies essential to credentials, and work with employers or with artists or with whatever community I wanted to join or employment to define those kinds of things. I don't think we're doing a great job at that. I still think we're measuring bums in seat time, I don't think we demonstrate competencies, and I don't think we're trusting students to learn. And I think if we want to be relevant today and relevant in the economy and relevant to young people, we better start trusting them. Number two, I'm sitting at a council with a whole bunch of university presidents. And one of them complained about the college. He said, I got a college, how do I compete? I said, well, what's your biggest concern? What do you most want? I want certainty this president said. I want certainty. Well, I nearly fell off my chair. Having run my own small business, been a managing partner in a large high-risk business, having rebuilt a, a not-for-profit in, in this city that was almost bankrupt, he wants certainty. He's talking to a cabinet minister in a government that was at 20% in the polls at the time with its premier change and a majority opposition that could bring us down in a New York minute and he wants certainty. He heads up a publicly funded institution with great endowments. His paycheck comes every two weeks without even blinking. He never has to worry about it. He's paid about three times what I'm paid. He, the faculty there are tenured. They can say anything they want and not lose their job. Geez, I wonder if I as a politician could say anything I want and not lose my job. That must be a nice feeling. It's heavily unionized pension, publicly subsidized pension, and he wants certainty. We have a problem, Houston. Tenure was supposed to create dynamic risk, entrepreneurial, critical thinking individuals that would challenge the status quo. It seems to have attracted too many people from whom protection and risk aversion is the reward of academia. Is there a safer place? Is there a more protected life? Is there a greater privilege in our society than being a faculty member? Is there anything more rewarding than working with young people who are creative, brilliant, dynamic, and exciting? My three years at U of T were like heaven to me. I met the most bright people. I worked with some of the most ingenious faculty. I was exposed to ideas and challenged on much of my own thinking. It was one of the most dynamic and exciting parts experiences in my life. That's what our universities and colleges are.
but they can't just be that in the internal exploration of ideas. Because it isn't the economy of 1957 when I was born. It isn't where two-thirds of people make stuff for a living, and the people who go to university are one in five, and they're on track for academia or certain required professions like law and medicine. Now, 70 or 80 percent of people require post-secondary credentials, and post-secondary education is a mass education system, much like our high schools were a generation ago. But they're much more important. They're the most important social, cultural, and economic institutions in our society. No city, no urban region will likely be successful without a good college, without a university, and without research intensive activity. Academic freedom needs to protect things. The most important asset, the most important degree one can get today is a liberal arts education. Interestingly, well, it's often the one that people think when we talk about the wider role of universities and colleges is we mean that the humanities and social sciences are somehow peripheral and engineering, mathematics, and those kinds of, uh, of natural sciences are going to take over. What we actually know is that liberal arts education is the foundational education. A matter of fact, it seems to, to me that that is more critical than anything else. And when you talk to academics who have people who are working with people who are on a PhD track, or you talk to bankers who are trying to find that genius, young, creative person who can rethink systems and bring new ideas to the table, those critical thinking skills are the most important. A matter of fact, it appears from the Kaufman studies in the United States that getting a finance degree is about the least engaging and the one choice of undergraduate education that gives you the least uplift in critical thinking skills. So, so, so people who think that the conversation we're trying to have is all about a utilitarian approach, quite the opposite. Our dynamic, our, and, and, and our dynamic fine arts, humanities, and social sciences, and the whole range of education is important. As a matter of fact, it always annoys me no end when I go into public schools and folks say to me, that, uh, you know, we're going to teach music. I said, well, why are you going to teach music? Well, it makes math skill, it really improves math skills, you know? Students are more organized. They tend to show up more on time. Teachers like it. Teachers are happier, and attendance is better. Well, there's a pretty utilitarian measurement of music. Can't we just have music because it's beautiful? It's uh, emotional. Uh, it leads us to a higher sense of our own soulfulness and our own humanity. It is, gives us joy. It makes us smile. It makes us dance. It makes life worth living. It is just inherently a beautiful thing. These are the kinds of things that uniquely happen in universities and colleges because they're about discovery, which is why I believe that research intensive activities in universities and discovery in the classroom are linked and important things. And that we have to differentiate some institutions that are much more employment track and competency based to meet the employment challenge. And in the same way, when we face the last challenge in Ontario's history, which was in the post Second World War, and I have to say that we've had so many wars in the last hundred years, I have to now be more specific. Uh, the post Second World War and the arrival of the baby boom in the 60s and 70s onto university and colleges campus, at the same time we were going through probably the largest expansion of our industrial service economy in our history in the last half of the last century, universities were challenged at that time to try and deal with the new skills-based economy. And that led us to come to the conclusion that traditional research intensive and liberal arts colleges could not meet that challenge. And in 1967, Centennial College opened its doors in Scarborough to a headline in the Toronto Star that I will never forget, and Bill Davis will remind you of, Drop Out You. And many <coughs> well-educated, sophisticated, erudite academics looked down their nose at these new colleges and said the Ontario government was dumbing down post-secondary education, uh, creating glorified high schools and colleges for dropouts. That we could not understand that the diversity uh, required for post-secondary education was essential to meet that challenge. 
that our universities, if we had actually tried to repurpose U of T or McMaster or Queens or God knows who to that function, it would have been totally inappropriate. That's not why we have a U of T or McMaster or Queens, or I could mention many others. I hate to say one or two because, it's, I, as I said, I love you all equally. <laughs> and it was a good thing because I think it made our universities better. They were able to differentiate themselves, look at second entry degrees, define their commitment to the economy for employment, and protect all of the other endeavors of social, cultural, and educational institutions that they had to protect. And if we had not created the colleges, one of two things would have happened. We would have undermined the intent and, and, and core competencies and the excellence of our universities, and probably at the same time, would have failed to pr produce a highly skilled workforce that allowed our GDP to grow at an enormous rate uh, in the last half of the last century that created the tax base to indeed support healthcare and education and all the things that we did. So the conversation which some people have found annoying my, and from some of my friends who were in government in the 60s and 70s and 80s have pointed out, sounds a lot like the conversations about technology enabled learning, what the Australians have done, uh, what a gentleman who's gonna speak to you in a moment has done uh, with Western governors, that this new diversity of learning pathways, of student-centered learning, of outcome-based learning, of competency learning, of globally integrated content that is now shared, the, all of these new pathways are not a way of turning our universities or our colleges into Walmart institutions and discounted, dumbed-down education. They actually operate at a standard of competency and evaluation and accreditation that's higher than many of the standards we have for physically, geographically-based institutions. A matter of fact, I will tell you, I think one of the things is that is going to happen is that the accreditation standards for our programs are starting to stay a lot higher and that we're going to put more weight on institutions to demonstrate the relationship between competencies and degrees where that's relevant and important in employment, where engineering and many other fields. And it's going to require us to, to not have every institution create every single bit of content and that the quality standards are going to have to be a lot higher. The idea is when I hear students tell me that they go into classrooms that well, they used to have a faculty member and a TA, and now it's only a TA and no faculty member and a video screen at the front of the classroom. That kind of stuff isn't going to cut it anymore. So excellence in content is going to have to be changed. So I'm going to wrap this up in a minute. I know I understand. Thanks very much. I, I, I think someone just put the uh, speed sign up. So my friend Sheldon Levy, to go back to Sheldon, took a course. He took a two, second year genetics course online through the British system. Came back and said it was the most amazing course he'd taken. That there were very few geneticists or faculty that could teach the kind of genetics and that. This was a British university that was an incredible center of excellence. And he said, but I, I was wanting. I wanted group study. I wanted more mentoring. I wanted problem-based. So I wanted to write a paper on this. I wanted to explore it. So I said, why don't you use that content? Why doesn't Ryerson do that? Why don't you do that with U of T? Why don't you go down and see Alan Edwards at the Center for Structural Genomics and put together a mentoring and, like, why can't we use this kind of excellent content out of Harvard, out of Stanford, out of MIT and bring it home? Why can't we take our excellent, Sheridan has the best animation content in the world. It's one on the 100 rated animation schools. We have four others. Why are four other colleges creating content that doesn't even rank on the top 100 when we've already nailed the skills-based competency of this and they can walk into Pixar and get a job? Different types of institutions, different types of challenges. Middle-aged folks like me who at a mo moment's notice, because we live in the world of uncertainty, may have to reinvent ourselves for a new job, depending on how you're feeling about us at any particular point in time. <laughs> so I, 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 I confess to a certain amount of self-interest. <laughs> but I do want to introduce you to someone and get off the stage, because he's way more interesting than I am. Unfortunately, we don't get to vote for him, though I'd love to steal him away because I think there are very few individuals that have actually built an institution for our time in a way that was at first threatening to many traditional institutions in the United States, but I now think those institutions now see this institution and this gentleman as one of their best friends because he has helped differentiate the larger student market in a way that has created greater clarity for research-intensive universities and colleges. Western Governors University and his, his is based in Texas, but it's, um, the institution uh, is a collaborative uh, process of 19 governors in 19 states. 
is a not-for-profit institution that provides affordable, accredited, high-quality online and blended degree programs in high-demand fields, very differentiated. And that Mark Milliron, who is the chancellor who is here with us uh, today, has a huge number of accomplishments that brought him to that post, including being the former deputy director of the, for post-secondary improvement with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. He is award-winning leader, author, speaker, and consultant in leadership development, future trends, learning, strategies, and the human side of technology change. I'm really looking forward to his insights. I hope you will take inspiration for him, and he is a man that is not afraid of uncertainty and trusts his students. Thank you very much. Thanks, Minister. What I hope we can do is extend this conversation and talk a bit about some deeper learning conversations that are happening really across all of North America. There are conversations about how the education ecosystem is taking shape now and in the years to come. And I want to engage you in that conversation for a bit. Um, I really only have about a handful of, of topics I want to roll through. But it, it all is predicated on a core belief or a core idea that I think you share. Um, this report came out last year in the U.S. and kind of shook people to the bone. Uh, it was called Reclaiming the American Dream. It was a hardcore self-assessment of the, our nations, um, of the American community college system. And it was probably one of the most brutal self-assessments you've ever seen in terms of it really taking a look at itself and asking whether or not the community college sector in the U.S. was meeting the needs for the country. And one of the most clear calls out of this piece was this idea that upward mobility, the contract between one generation and the next, is under siege. And, and it re this relates, by the way, to the work we did at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And I can tell you with great clarity, I mean, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is focused on a very clear mission, which is to help people have the chance to live healthy and productive lives. How that plays out internationally is in global health and global development, trying to cure AIDS, polio, and, and global development anti-poverty programs. In the U.S., the data that hit Bill and Melinda between the eyes was the idea of social mobility and the idea that the intergenerational transmission of poverty had never been higher than it is right now. And the single biggest dis disruptor of that cycle of poverty um, was the, used to be a K-12 education, but it is now the achievement of a post-secondary credential with labor market value. Notice I didn't say a college degree for all, because a lot of people will conflate those conversations. Uh, what I said was a post-secondary credential with labor market value, meaning apprenticeship, certification, diploma, and degrees, the family of credentials that are given within the post-secondary community. The biggest problem is a post-secondary credential with labor market value doesn't fit neatly on a bumper sticker. Right? So it becomes a complex set of conversations. What it basically means is that education is a game changer, and in particular, by the way, folks, for the low-income strivers in our world, because the data shows the high-income quartiles, top two-income quartiles, you almost don't have to worry about them that much. They're anywhere between 70 and 85% likely to finish their credential if they get started. It's the low-income folks that are striving that have the biggest challenges, and in many states in the U.S., it's down as low as 10 and 12%. And I know as you're looking at your own post-secondary system, you're thinking yourself about the idea of it being an economic engine and an opportunity engine. And one of the things that's clear, and what I've done, and by the way, what I'm going to do with the PowerPoint presentation is I'm going to give it to the folks here so they can post it. Um, any research report I talk about, and I'll talk about a number of them, is linked within the PowerPoint presentation so you can follow it. I'm hoping you don't have to worry about taking notes. You can just use this as a guide. Um, I'm very careful about PowerPoints. I only have about seven slides. Um, a lot of students have told me that many people who use PowerPoint have no power nor a point. <laughs> I'm careful about that. <laughs> But what this slide does is it takes you out to a blog post that talks about the, the hardcore data that shows that education is the pathway to possibility. It's a pathway to further education. It's a pathway to economic opportunity. It's a pathway to social mobility. It's a pathway to agency, to personal efficacy. And we, we all kind of get this in our bones. And if you really believe that it is part of this engine of our our national um, kind of excellence, if you will, then you want to have this larger conversation about the ecosystem of education and how we can play in it. And these deeper conversations, I would argue, have to begin with some conversations that put learning in the center of the dialogue. 
And I'm just going to lay out five of them that are happening all across North America and some around the world. And they're conversations around the notion of being learning-centered, conversations about who the learners really are, about credential pathways, about the innovations with technology, and a lot of conversations about new model institutions and kind of the ecosystem of providers that are coming together. Um, I'm going to try to put these together in a way where they kind of, uh, there's a sense of coherence to it so we can kind of get a sense of how this is actually playing out. Before we jump into this conversation, though, I want to talk about the way we approach the dialogue, because this is part of the challenge. Uh, I think part of the challenge is catalyzing constructive conversations on these topics. Um, and it relates to something a friend of mine who's a neuroscientist who helped me design this exercise um, makes the point about. So for this exercise, I do need both of your hands clear. So if you're holding something, you got to put it down for a second. I know this will stop the tweet stream. I'm sorry about that. So what you're going to do is you're going to put both your hands in the air like this. Okay. Count of three, we're going to clap them together hard and leave them there. One, two, three. Rub them up and down. Clasp them together. Put them down on the table or in your lap. You choose. <clears throat> now look at your hands. How many of you, by a show of hands, have your right thumb on top? Raise your hand if your right thumb is on top. Keep your hands up. Look around the room and get a sense of the right thumbers, who they are. These are the right thumbers. Hands back down. Raise your hand if you are a left thumber. Raise your hand and hold it up. Look around the room at the left thumbers. Okay, hands back down. When the researchers were studying this, they're studying something basically called autonomic functioning. Autonomic functioning is your brain likes to get things neurosynaptically wired so it can get on to more new and novel things. Um, you have core autonomic functions you have no control over, like if you sneeze, you'll close your eyes. Go ahead and try not to. Um, up to what they call the autopilots, and the autopilots are my favorite. They're things like you arrive at work after a 30-minute drive, and you can't remember a thing about the drive you just took, right? Uh, or my favorite from one of their books is you get out of the shower and you're naked, but you have no idea if you washed your hair or not. <laughs> you were just in there, right? Okay. This is called a correlate autonomic, which means they think it's correlated to something else. And they, the correlate autonomics are kind of interesting. They're things like, and one of the things they talk about is they think your dominant sleep position is actually correlated to how you were positioned in the womb, which I don't know how you'd study that, but something like that. But whether you put your right thumb or left thumb on top, what do you think they thought it was correlated to, what it was related to? Yeah, whether you were right, left-handed or right-handed. You just saw the data, though. Is it related to that? No, it's almost exactly 50-50, which kind of freaked them out. So they started diving in. What do you think the me next major theory was? Left brain, right brain. They thought for sure it was left brain. Everyone got all trendy. They brought in the social scientists. They studied that. Nowhere near the level of confidence they needed to make them think that was it. So now they really went after it. They started doing cluster analytics and data mining, and they started creating personality profiles, Myers-Briggs, and they had a complete profile. They're grad students. They had time on their hands. They really went after this. <laughs> <clears throat> and they created a complete profile of the right thumbers um, with all the characteristics of it, a complete profile of the left thumbers. And by the way, for you right thumbers, they have a great name for your group. They call you the sexy people. <laughs> so you're the sexy ones. No, you can't change your thumbs now. <laughs> it's, not, it's not a choice, right? Um, left thumbers, don't feel left out. They have a name for your group as well. They call you the sneaky people. <laughs> so you got it. Um, what's interesting is, it, and it's very stable, it's about 1 to 100 people put neither their right thumb nor their left thumb on top. They actually put their thumbs side by side. How many did we get in here that are the side by side folks? We got one, two, three. So the data are weirdly stable about this. By the way, the researchers say these are the people to watch. <laughs> these are the ones who are sneaky about being sexy, right? <laughs> I want you to get in on this. But there is a point to this exercise. So do me a favor, clear your hands again. We're going to put our hands back in the air again. Count of three. We're going to clap them and hold them there in place. One, two, three. Rub them up and down. Clasp them together. Now put them up in front of your face. Butterfly them out. Got it. Now slowly put them back the other way with the other set of fingers interlaced and the other thumb on top. Squeeze it and put it down. How does it feel? Weird. Oh, somebody said sexy. I heard that. <laughs> I want you to get this for a second. I want you to just viscerally get this. Here is our challenge. Our challenge is not necessarily people who are against change. There's always those folks in the world in this kind of conversations, or people who are way too for the change that they're advocating. Um, they think everyone's supposed to be doing online learning or they're Satan in some way. What we're really worried about are 
dealing with these catalytic conversations with people who've put in 10, 20, 30, 40, sometimes 50 years of their life into this thing called education, and they have it wired. They have a sense of how it's supposed to feel, touch, and taste. Okay? And when you start talking about new technologies, new techniques, new strategies, and new structures, how does it feel to them? Yeah, doesn't feel sexy. And I just want to be clear about this because part of our challenge is I think too many people try to sell people on change. And what we need to do is have is deeper, more catalytic conversations about what's in front of us and really look at the good, bad, and the ugly of the data and figure out how we want to move forward. And it's not simple because we're a asking for deep structural change to something that people know in their bones. And if you really go to the core of it, I like to begin with learning because we can all agree that we want to advance learning in some way. We really want to take the time to unpack how learning is happening. And what is pretty clear is, is the, the proponents of, of a notion called learning-centered education, which is not new. It's been around in a really coherent way since the early 90s, but it's really been for thousands of years in education, this notion of putting learning at the core of what we do, basically says, ask yourself two burning questions when looking at any of your, your programs or policies or practices, which is one of two things. One, does this program policy practice improve or expand learning? Okay. And the second big question is, how do you know? What's your data? Because right now, most of these conversations are driven by whoever tells the best story. Right? It's the culture of anecdote that drives this kind of piece. And this kind of commitment to saying, how do we know this is improving learning? And are we asking the constituents who are actually receiving this? And are, do we have the data underneath us, qualitative and quantitative, in terms of how this plays out? And just, I'm going to give you a couple of examples of this. One is, is one that is, is pretty compelling, and it's in the online learning world, that comes from Carnegie Mellon. Carnegie, Carnegie Mellon's Open Learning Initiative, which is probably one of the signature open learning initiatives out there, um, what they do is they look at online learning and they use human learning science to tune how they construct courses. And one of the things they've done is as they've rolled out online learning, they've said, let's be meticulous about figuring out what to present, how to present it, and what sequence, how, whether you repeat it, and how you do this in an online format. And they use human learning science and dashboards to actually tune this with students and with faculty. And what they have shown is if you bring a really focused, learning-centered mindset to this, you can actually teach pretty complex topics like statistics in half the time with better results just by bringing a laser focus on learning on the other side of it. What they found, by the way, is that it varied based on the students. So they had this result with their own students, then they went out and tried to do it with at-risk students that were in surrounding community colleges, and they found out doing it solely online was a disaster. And what they found out is you had to blend it. You had to do it with some face-to-face -face and some online, and the blending ended up creating the same effect. Again, by being focused on the learning and who the learners are, they were able to come to the same kind of initiative. And it's, this is the same kind of thing that's happening with you know, the Sal Khans of the world who are talking about the flip model, which is the idea of analyzing the strategy for deployment and figuring out what's the best way to leverage online resources and on-ground resources. The flip model is nothing new. We've been doing it since the 70s and 80s with videotapes. We just have a lower friction way of doing it. But what Sal Khan did with Khan Academy is say, let's teach math in a different way. Let's teach math in a way where the homework is watching the lecture, okay? And the classwork is doing the homework together in small groups with a teacher. Because when are you stuck in math? You're stuck in math at 11 o'clock at night when you're trying to actually understand it and you need somebody to help you. Because when Sal Khan started developing his videos, and if you haven't seen his videos, you've got to check out Khan Academy. It is worth the trip. When, Google, when the people at Google found it and Bill Gates found it and started funding this as a foundation side, Sal basically started this whole thing trying to tutor his niece in another state um, doing micro lectures on math, anywhere from 10 to 20 minute ma micro lectures on different concepts in math. And he suddenly found out he had hundreds of thousands of lurkers on his YouTube channel. And he's like, people watch kittens on YouTube. What are they watching math videos for? Who were they? Who were they? They weren't students. They were parents. They were trying to figure out how to help their kid in math. Okay? And he suddenly became this little cult PTA hero. right? <laughs> and so suddenly the foundations found him. And now with the support of foundations, and he's quit his job full time as, as a day, basically as a hedge fund trader. And all he does is create, the, now he's really into this learning stuff. And what he's done is created a micro lecture in math in every concept from basic arithmetic to vector calculus. 
and he's pushing the, the flip model, which is this idea that the lecture is done at home and you watch it on your own time, and then in the classroom you work the problem. By the way, the flip model is deployed in lots of different strategies with the faculty recording their own versions of the lecture or curating a lecture from a master um, lecturer that's out there, and then the in-class experience is new. By the way, this is nothing new. McKeechee and the great studies of teaching have talked about active and dialogic learning being the center of the classroom for a long time. And what Open Learning Initiative and SalCon and others have focused on, and I love this idea, is how do you use technology to make human moments precious, right? And the whole idea is you leverage technology to make human moments more precious because we know we can deploy all the resources out there. And think about it this way. I mean, a lot of people are frustrated about online learning and skeptical of it. I'm on the board of the Global Online Academy. The Global Online Academy is a consortium of the most elite private schools in the United States. We're talking about the Sidwell Friends, Lakesides of the World, the Punahou School, and others. People who send all of their kids to Harvard, Stanford, MIT. And they collectively got into online learning for a few reasons. One is they wanted, um, first, their parents were saying, our students are leaving your caring arms and going to universities that are radically deploying online learning. And, they're not, and without the experience, they're left to their own devices, and it's a problem. So it's a basic skill. Two, there might be something we can learn in this, but we want to make sure we do it the way that makes sense for the culture of our institutions. So they created a consortium so they could actually experiment together to figure out how it works. And third, they created a learning value proposition, which is the global classroom, where any of the students that, that step into those online courses are sitting in a classroom with a global group of students. Students from China, students from Jordan, stu and, and studying world events with a global class is different. Right? So the whole focus for them is lots, let's not just do online learning, let's create a unique learning value proposition for our institution if we're going to do it. Final model I'll talk about is, is something like Western Governors University. Western Governors University is radically focused on learning at the core of what we do. Just unpack a little bit about our model. What our model does is we'll take, we're, we're four colleges, business, education, health, and IT. We, were we will take a degree program like, let's say, cybersecurity information assurance. We will sit down with the industry leaders and the academics side by side. This is a big part of our model. And we will define what's called a learning competency map. And a learning competency map for that degree is basically what does a student need to know and be able to do to make us feel comfortable that they have mastered the content and the capabilities necessary out of that degree. And it's done in concert with industry and with the academics. By the way, that is the hardest work of our entire model is sitting down and developing the competency map, anywhere between 100 and 150 core competencies. Once that's done, we go curate the best digital curricular resources that would help a student master those competencies or those capabilities, and then we go find the assessments uh, and or develop the assessments that would tell us that they have mastered those competencies. And by the way, many of those assessments are performance-based. Then we begin with the student, and the, with the student, we begin with two basic assumptions. We begin with the assumption that students come to us knowing different things with the ability to learn at different rates. Would you agree with those assumptions? Are our institutions set up to handle those assumptions? No. But we absolutely do that. And part of it's because we have people coming out of the military who've had three years of medical training who are coming into uh, nursing programs and being asked to take basic phlebotomy courses they could be teaching. Right, just because they didn't have the credentials. Our idea is if we can pull them in, we figure out what they already know, and if we think they already know it, we give them the opportunity to take the assessment, and if they can pass the assessment, they're done with that. They're sitting through 16 weeks if they can already show us that they've mastered that competency. Then we match them with our faculty. Our faculty is a different model. Most faculty in higher ed are deployed as a general practitioners. They do everything from soup to nuts. They define the course, pick the, the learning outcomes, choose the content and the assessments, deliver the instruction, and then turn in the grades. Ours, we actually have specialist faculty. We have faculty who are student mentors and course mentors and evaluators. The student mentors are people who are incredibly good at mentoring and connecting with students. And they'll meet with that student. And they, by the way, they carry a student load of anywhere between 40 and 70 students, depending on 40 and 60 students, depending on risk model and a host of other things. But they will stay with their student from first contact till the time they finish their degree. So it's kind of the Oxford model. They stay with that student, and they, what they do is in six-month chunks, they determine these are the learning competencies we think you can achieve in the next six months, and they'll start going on the journey. That student will meet with their mentor every single week, usually via conference call or video chat, and have deep interaction and synthesize and analyze and connect and be coached by that faculty member every single week all the way through their entire program. They will then interact with called course mentors. And course mentors are all PhD specialists in different topic areas who come in and come out based on which competency the student is trying to achieve. 
And the biggest thing in this model is when the student has mastered the content and they've shown us they mastered the content, they move on to the next thing. And instead of taking five courses at the same time, they can turn it on its end and go one at a time or two at a time when it makes sense for them. And for a working adult, it really works. Our student population is typically 36, anywhere from 25 to 55, working adult complex lives. This model actually works really well for them. But the whole idea is they have to demonstrate and document that they've learned something before they move on, and they have deep personal relationships in this model. Our engagement scores are off the chart. The interesting thing about this model is how people just suddenly have to take a deep breath around this because that it, it, we don't measure, it's not about seat time, it's completely about learning. When they've mastered all the content, they're done, okay, and they graduate. And, and the interesting thing is you have people who are coming to us with, with thousands of hours of training and development from corporations, from the military, or just from life experience who can get through these competencies quicker and can accelerate. Would you agree that's kind of a core model, an interesting model to roll in? I don't think it's the only model, but boy, it's one of those models you can roll in and say this is an interesting thing to, th to think about. If you take, put learning at the center, you can change the conversation in terms of what you do, and you can allow for acceleration and for flexibility. And if you're really thinking about who the learners are, it changes your conversation. Because in the higher education world, the post-secondary world, there is an ecosystem of learners, and the dominant policy conversation, however, gets hijacked by the students that are coming right from secondary or they're going full-time and living on campus. In the United States, that represents less than 20% of the students in post-secondary education. I would challenge you to look at your own data in that. What our data shows is the modal student in higher education is on a much more complex journey, and they tend to be swirling. They're coming in and they're coming out of post-secondary education, and they're coming at different ages and stages. They're changing careers. They're upskilling. They're coming through a primary cycle and a secondary cycle, and figuring out that journey really matters. And a lot of this conversation tends to be thinking about how you diversify your post-secondary institution to think about how your colleges and your universities and your other providers work together to serve different kinds of learners as they're coming in. Uh, as I said, our typical learner is not the right from high school student. In Western Governors University, less than 3% of our students come right from high school. In fact, when students come to us from the, the secondary world or they come without college experience, we often tell them we are probably the wrong university for you. And if you've seen the, re the report from WCET, it makes a lot of sense. WCET did one of the largest federated data set studies of student um, success ever done, where they looked at multiple sectors of higher education and mapped student success pathways through higher education. And what they basically found, one of the big findings, is what they called the eHarmony effect. The eHarmony effect is basically the right student with the right, institu with the right institution on the right kind of degree program pathway wonderful things can happen. The wrong match is a disaster, okay? And part of our challenge is, is this move towards one best way. We just keep pushing towards one best way when the truth is there's lots of different best ways. If you have to give you a simple example, my niece graduated top of her high school class out of a rural Western North Carolina high school. She got a full scholarship to Chapel Hill. She went to Chapel Hill in the Moorhead Scholarship, did incredibly well, graduated near the top of her class, and loved her experience at Chapel Hill. She moved back to Western North Carolina, got married, and three years later wanted to start a business, wanted to get her MBA. All the MBA programs in Western North Carolina required her to drive anywhere from two to three hours, three or four times a week to be able to take the program, and the other online programs did not work with at all because they were all time-based. So she decided to go to Western Governors, and she got her, her master's degree, MBA from Western Governors, in two years. And when she will tell you, she will say she absolutely loved her time at Western Governors University. She's still in deep personal contact with her mentor who brought her all the way through the entire program. She's in the process of opening her business right now. And she will tell you that she would not trade her Chapel Hill experience for anything. It was the right thing for the right time. And she would not trade her Western Governors experience for anything. It was the right, th right, right institution at the right time. Does that make sense? But it means you've got to, in our minds, be able to handle the fact that we have different learners coming to us with different strategies. And especially, I would say, the people who get the shortest shrift are adult learners and people who are displaced workers who have to come back in. And most of our policy discussions are thinking about the primary cycle learner, the one who's on the first time through post-secondary, when our policy conversations have to be much more robust and complex about different learners coming in at different times, especially things like incumbent workers. Let me tell you what, I've done the student focus groups. Somebody who is working full-time who wants to get the master's degree to get ahead or even want to get the bachelor's degree to move ahead and they're working full-time and they're trying to raise two or three kids 
it is incredibly difficult for them to go full time. If they try to take four and five courses at the same time over a 16 week period, the number one reason they're dropping out is a variable called life happens. It's true. I mean, car breaks down, kids get sick, money runs out, and over 16 weeks, one of those things is probably going to happen. And if you're taking five courses at the same time and it happens over 16 weeks, you lose all of those five courses. Okay? Whereas if you take, for example, the Western Governor's model or the sequential month at a time model that a lot of universities use, uh, an adult learner can go chunk by chunk by chunk, and if something happens here, it just happens for two or three weeks, and they get back on the learning trail. That's a different model for a different kind of learner. It means you have to have different kinds of options. Most of our models are retrofitted residential models that are built on the idea of somebody coming right from a secondary experience and going through in four years. That's not the reality for most. I would challenge you to look at your data. It's not the reality for most of your learners. Most of your learners are doing, have much more complex lives, and I would argue that most of your learners are doing something called learning and earning. They're working while they go to school. Okay, and that's one of the, if you want to see something interesting, look at the website, Corporate Voices for Working Families. It has profiles of what I would call learn and earn sync programs, where corporations are working hand in hand with local um, educational institutions, and they're trying to create models where it is easier for a working learner to be successful. Everything from flexible scheduling so they can manage their education time to online models to hybrid models, weekend colleges. Um, there's a great college, Collin Collin County College in, in Texas, that has this vibrant weekend college. And what's interesting is students get through in a faster time in their weekend college than they do in their standing on ground college. And it's because they blend it. They do face to face on the weekend, the rest of the time they do it online, and they're able to kind of go through and accelerate. And 80% of the students in that program are what kind of students, if you had to guess, the core demographic of that student? And it's not just working, because I already gave you that hint. It's returning women who are working with kids. And what they will tell you is the weekend is their time. It's their time to be with their colleagues, be in the class and do that, and they can get child care for that. During the week, they have complex life with lots of things going on. They need the flexibility of online. So it's the model that works for them. But the idea is figuring out the model that actually works. And the deeper sinks with Learn and Earn are with employers actually give credit for training they're already doing. And so you actually map the training the corporations are doing to the kinds of program you're doing. For example, with Western Governors, we have worked so closely with the tech industry that if you go through our information assurance program, we've worked with the National, um, with the National Security Agency and a host of others, as you go through our program, you will leave our bachelor's program with 11 industry certifications and the bachelor's degree. And the idea is we've built these industry certifications into the assessment model so that the idea you can ladder the credential, which I'll talk about in a bit. Now, third big conversation, which is around this credential mapping. This is not as important, again, for high-income students. High-income students are going to get through the bachelor's degree or get through the master's degree. They have tons of support, but especially low-income students, you've got to start thinking in terms of credential pathways. And credential pathways means your education ecosystem needs to begin to work together to make it more likely that people accumulate credentials along the pathway, especially things like industry certifications into associate's degrees, into bachelor's degrees. And that's happening in a number of places right now in the U.S. that are really interesting interesting conversations. In Texas, for example, um, WGU started the Finish to Go Further program. In our Finish to Go Further program, it is a transfer program with our community colleges where we incent the community college student to finish their associate's degree before they transfer. Because right now, the modal student transfers before the associate's degree. Our data shows that they get the associate degree, especially if they're low income, they're twice as likely to get the bachelor's degree. So our incentive is for them to finish the associate's degree, and if they do, we give them a 5% tuition discount, and we give them access to scholarships. And the whole idea is to get, earn them the credential before they come. Because again, the number one reason low-income folks on credential pathways drop out is life happens. If they have a backstopped post-secondary credential, like an industry certification or an associate's, before they get to the bachelor's degree, when life happens and they have to stop out and take care of it, they don't slip back into poverty, and they're more likely to stay on that journey. Does that make sense? It's a different way of thinking about this ecosystem. And it also means it makes you sync even more closely with the labor market to figure out how those, again, it has to have labor market value. You can't just invent credentials if you're going to go along. It has to be something that is valued within this. But I'm going to tell you about the credential thing. You've got to think this through because the learning pathways are changing, including students and running you. And if you want to challenge yourself on this, I encourage you to read two books. One is called DIYU, which is Do-It-Yourself University by Anya Komenetz. And she has a follow-up book called EduPunk's Guide to a DIY Credential. 
And this is where students are, are considered edupunks because they are end-running educational institutions. Either they're within your caring arms and they're not getting what they need and they're going to other universities and the millions of courses that are online and they're getting the lectures and concepts there and they're coming in and taking your assessments. Or they're doing it externally and they're knocking on your door and they're saying, give me any test you want and I'll show you I already know this. Right? But the idea is that they are trying to find other pathways to the credentials. And if you really care about learning at its core, you have to ask yourself what you're going to do about it. The American Council on Education right now is stimulating this conversation with our accrediting agencies because they're saying at some point we have to, just, we have to accredit learning, not just institutions. Because we're going to have people who are coming to us with different kinds of pathways as they're going to move through this kind of model. It's a different kind of model. When all that comes together, you have to have the technology that actually pulls this together. And I want to talk about this ecosystem because one of the most important things around this idea is understanding the tools we have to actually tackle these learning and learner and credential pathways challenges are more robust and interesting now than ever before. And in particular, what you're seeing is this rise of the blended infrastructure. I wrote a piece for the Chronicle of Higher Ed two years ago called Time to End the Family feud, where I basically made the argument that it is absolutely time to get over the conversation about what's better online or on ground. Because the truth is the teacher effect is so large it actually crosses out any of those kinds of things. And what we absolutely know now is most people have a blended experience where they're doing some online and some on ground and they're mixing and matching including purely blended kinds of courses. The challenge for us is figuring out how we use all the arrows in our quiver to actually hit the learning mark in some way and figure out how to thoughtfully blend it, again, to, to use the th all the things we're doing in the right way. Do me a favor. Take out your mobile devices. Some of you already have them. Have them hopped out. Many of you have to choose between one of the two or the three that you have in front of you. <laughs> Okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to find somebody in your right or your left that looks really t relatively trustworthy. I want you to trade your device with their device. Go ahead and trade them out. Okay, I want to make three three quick observations. One, there's a whole group of people in this audience right now that are feeling really good because you just traded up. <laughs> it's a good exercise. Two, I'm a student of human behavior. I love watching people in this exercise because there's one group of people that when they hand their device over just can't help themselves. They're so happy with their device they have to give you a mini orientation session. Oh, look at this. this, is, this is. I'm really excited about it. There's another group, and I don't know the logic behind this, but it happens every time. There's another group that, for some reason, feels the need to either lock or turn it off before they <laughs> hand it to you, right? <laughs> Which relates to the third observation, and this is learned from hard experience. The longer I let this exercise go, the more the anxiety in the room goes up <laughs> because somebody is touching your digital device, right? I did this with the American Association of Publishers, and in the front row was a young guy, made 23, 24 years old, really well dressed, who the minute I said, I'm gonna you know, take out your digital devices in a second, I'm gonna have you hand it to somebody, he just went white, <laughs> panicked. And I said, you know, go ahead and find somebody trustworthy and hand it over, and he just looked like he was gonna throw up on the spot. <laughs> He began to sweat, and it was, just, it was crazy, and he finally handed his device over, and I really thought he was going to pass out. And just minute by minute, he was about to drop. Finally, the whole exercise got over, and at the, end of the, at the end of the talk, I think he felt the need to come up and talk to me about it. And he came up to me, I'm like, first, are you okay? And he goes, yeah, I'm okay now. I'm like, what happened? And he goes, Mark, you have no idea how hard that was for me. And I go, what do you mean? He goes, because I've been having all kinds of trouble at work. In fact, you know, my family and my friends have all been trying to counsel me because we're all pretty convinced that my boss is, is evil. Just, and, and so they're all trying to help me and coach me. And in fact, they think he's so evil, they've nicknamed him Satan. And, and they're sending me all these encouraging notes and about how to, get, you know, how to handle Satan, what to do with this. He goes, and during this exercise, you had me hand my phone to Satan. <laughs> <laughs> He goes, I was terrified that one of my friends or family was going to send a text right when he was holding my phone. I'm like, did anything happen? He goes, thank God, no. And I'm like, good, good, good. So do me a favor, hand them back. I don't want anybody in trouble. But I do want to talk about this. <laughs> Go ahead, hand them back now. <laughs> 
What I want to point out is everybody in the room had a digital device. Okay? And what our students are more often than not saying is why are we not using our entire infrastructure, all of our digital resources to be able to impact learning? And what is happening now is a larger conversation about learning and technology that is more robust. And you're seeing this conversation around thoughtfully blending online and on ground and figuring out how we make the most of all the resources at our disposal, understanding that for some students it's about wants and needs. Some students absolutely need the flexibility of online. Some of them really want it. Most of them, by the way, want the blend. They want some combination of both of it. And part of us is figuring out what is best done online, what is best done face to face, and how do we maximize this, real, this mix for the different kinds of students that are coming our way, and again, bring a discipline to it. Part of it also is thinking about the changes in our infrastructure because of this digital footprint. I will tell you right now, the publishing industry is in, in a state of panic is probably too hard of a word, but it is really trying to figure out where it's going to be when it grows up. Because right now, it's kind of where the recording industry was about eight, nine years ago with the rise of Napster and digital sharing resources when it didn't know what that model was going to look like. And they fought it tooth and nail, but now they've leaned into it in a big way and they've made a lot of money. Publishing industry is in the exact same place around our textbooks, and you're seeing the rise of what I would call curricular resource strategy. And curricular resource strategy is people saying, time to end your textbook committees altogether. What you should be doing is you should be defining your learning objectives for a different course or whatever it might be, and then curating curricular resources that will help somebody achieve those. And you curate from three big sources. You cur curate from build by share. Build by share is you build it yourself because you are so good. If Sharon is that good on animation, bam, they build their own curriculum and that's what they deploy. Buy. You publishers have really good stuff. What you need to do is push the publishers to give you digital and modular content so you only pay for what you use as opposed to having to buy the entire textbooks. Are your students upset about textbook costs at all? Yeah, big deal. As colleges in the U.S. have been able to cut textbook costs by 50% simply just by going digital and modular and creating a different strategy for deployment. At Western Governors, we've leaned into what's called BYOD. BYOD is bring your own device. And what we've tried to do is deploy the curricular content wherever possible in a BYOD format because what we found is adult learners are stealing time to learn. They're stealing time at work, they're stealing time in line when they're picking up their kids, and they're on different devices. They're on handhelds, they're on iPads, they're on their laptops, or they want to print it. And our big idea is we want to have an infrastructure that allows them to do any of that and not have to lug around books. And it's worked, and by the way, our students absolutely love it. But the, and by the way, we're doing that right now in our homes with movies and with Kindle books and with Nooks and all the rest. Why do we think our students don't want to do the same thing on this? So you have the build, you have the buy, and then you have the share. There is a vibrant, open content community now all around the world. And if you're not plugged into this, it is worth doing the homework on it. You got to go look at sites like oercommons.org. OER Commons is openeducationcommons.org, uh, or openeducationresources.org. The Rice Connections Project, Hippocampus, there's just a whole array of folks that are doing it. And then once you start deploying these curricular resources, you've got to get tough-minded about what works and what doesn't, which is why the rise of the learning analytics movement is really interesting. And the learning analytics movement is pushing people to say, what, you know, think about your own experiences with things like Amazon, right? If you shop at Amazon or if you use Facebook or iTunes, if you shop in one of those places and they have these personalization engines, while you're shopping, it says what? People like you who bought this also bought this, this, and this, right? In fact, after a while, they get creepily good at selecting what else you might want to buy. You kind of look for those recommendations. That is a huge math run. They're doing a data mining project about you, a predictive model about what you might buy, and then bam, they're surfacing it to you, right? Now, does it take them like a week or a month to get you that data? How long does it take? Under a second. Only takes longer because of your bandwidth, <laughs> okay? And do they give it to you in spreadsheets and charts and graphs? No, they give it to you in a way that will help you make the decision of where you want to go next. To give you another example, look at the dashboard on the screen. That's from the Ford Fusion. The folks at Ford um, and the, with, the, with the hybrid Fusion, their drivers were having a problem. They weren't getting the gas mileage they were supposed to be getting, and they were really upset. That's the reason they were buying the, the hybrid in the first place. And they did the analysis to figure out why they weren't getting their gas mileage, and the big results came back and said, user error. The way the people are driving the car is making them not get the mileage they're supposed to get. How does that go over when you tell them it's their fault? 
Yeah, not really well. So they had to figure out a way to get them the data to help them make better choices within their driving. And so they couldn't put, they tried this little top 10 sheet, customers hated it. So they worked with a company called IDEO and they created a gamification project. And this is what they did. That is not just a decorative plant in the right hand side. It is a set, you, if you follow the rules of how to drive your car and they give you the, it's kind of a game. And if you drive your car the right way, the plant begins to grow and the leaves come out and the flowers bloom. If you drive your car the wrong way and you give your, your car to your son for the weekend and you get it back and the plant's dead, you kind of know what's happened during that time frame. By the way, this fixed the problem. Fixed the problem because you interacted with the data and gave them tuning information. This is what's happening in the world of education is people are saying we've got to get our arms around our data and the simplest thing is figuring out which curricular resources actually improve learning the most. So one of the things that we've done at Western Governors is we've actually signed contracts with the publishers where we don't pay them for content until the students have passed the assessments that they're studying the content for. And the publishers had a heart attack when we first proposed that, but we did that because we wanted a structural incentive for the publishers to fix bad content for them to go back and fix it. But the idea is we had to share the data to be able to do it. Imagine if you knew which 10 curricular resources were the most useless on your campus to be able to figure out how you can intervene and get better resources to those students. The idea of using the data in some way. Here's our story about data and education though. We're terrible. We, we, oh, student dropouts are a real problem. Student progression is a real problem. Let's collect some data about it. We get big teams together with spreadsheets and we end up with a war of the spreadsheets. And everybody argues about the quality of the data. And you've got to go collect some more data. And you come back in another war of the spreadsheets, another thing about the quality of the data. Then you say, we've got to bring the faculty in. You bring the faculty in, they're mad they weren't included from the beginning. You've got to start all over. <laughs> you go collect some more information. You bring that back together. Finally, well, there's really a problem here. Let's bring it up to senior administration. You bring it to senior administration. And they look at it and say, "Woo, this is pretty hard data. We've got to figure out how we stand against other universities and colleges. So they want you to go collect information from the other colleges, the comparison matrix. So you have to get data permissions from the other colleges, have them run their data, come back together, and you get your final master chart after months of pulling out data together. You bring it up to the president. The president looks at it and says, wow, this is really a challenge. We have to bring it to our board of governors. You bring it to, you get on the calendar for the board of governors. You present to the board. They don't know what you're talking about. It takes you two or three meetings. You finally convince them there's a problem. They think your idea, the best idea is to have somebody lead this initiative, so now you have to do a search. You do a search, you finally, after seven months, you hire the person, bring them in, their first recommendation is to buy software to tackle the challenge, which means now you have to do an RFP to bring the companies in to figure out which software to buy to take on the challenge. What has happened to the students about whom you collected the data? Yeah, their kids have enrolled <laughs> at your institution, right? Okay. Just think about the difference between Amazon's one second and are more than a year before we process a student's data to use their data to help them make a better choice and go in a better direction. There are some really exciting initiatives that right, going on right now. I work with a company called Civitas Learning that is developing apps that go directly to students, directly to faculty members, that allows them to tune their learning journeys. You have programs like Purdue's um, Signals Project, which is the simplest of ideas. What Purdue did is they said, let's look at the learning management system data for the courses that are wiping out the most students. They began with chemistry. And when they analyzed the data, what they did is they ran a predictive model. And they said, this is great. We can begin to tune the course. They said, stop. Um, and they said, Let, let's do something different for a change. And let's figure out how we can get the John Campbell, who's the chief scientist behind this, said, let's get the data to the students and to the teachers so they can tune the learning. So in real time, they got the data. They said, what are we going to give them, cross tabs and spreadsheets? No. They created a traffic light. And the traffic light ran the predictive model every time the student logged into that chemistry course, every time. And it said one of three things. Students like you, who did the kind of things you're doing right now in this course, succeeded. Green light. Keep doing that. Students like you, who did the kind of things you're doing, eh, did okay. Yellow light. Here's some things you might want to think about. Students like you, who did the kind of things you're doing in this course, failed miserably. Red light. Stop right now. Talk to somebody. And again, ran every time the student logged in. And everyone thought the students would be off put by this. They loved it because they found out earlier when they were off track. If you believe in your gut, as, as I do, around the notion of student tenacity, which is that students need to develop the tenacity to guide their own learning journey, what you know is the growth mentality requires feedback. You have to know when you're on track and off track. And this is part of, a, what, part of our, our job should be, is to harvest data and get it directly to the front lines. Most of our data initiatives are too slow and they're off target. 
They get data to administrators and legislators and governors as opposed to the front lines. And so the big conversation now is about how we get data to the front lines and change this conversation and drive, drive a personalization conversation if you're going to make this kind of work. Now, if you pull all this together and get tough-minded about it, what you find is that Lots of different institutions are doing lots of different things, and they're trying to work together in an ecosystem of education providers. And one of the most important things you can do is get over the better than habit. And the better than habit is different sectors of education talking about how much better than they are than the other one. When the truth is our education ecosystems are better with strong research universities, good access universities, good community colleges, alternative learning providers like the Western Governors and others, collaborating and working together to meet the needs of post-secondary education. There's almost too much need out there right now. And the question for us is how we can work together and create a more seamless system where we can work together on this kind of model with more sustaining and disruptive innovations and having people play different roles within this ecosystem and understanding that learning matters and the outcomes matter for the different students that are coming through. Lots of good models out there for you to look at to get a sense of how people are doing this, the biggest lens I'd ask you to use is who are they serving, what strategies are they using, and what are the learning outcomes? Because those are the kinds of lenses we should be using, not whether or not their model differs from yours. Okay? The idea should be thinking about whether or not they're actually reaching the learning targets they're going after in some way. Final idea. If you pull these five conversations together, I think the biggest thing for us to do is to rise to the challenge. I wrote a piece a couple of months ago. Um, it, was whole no, it was an open letter to students called You're the Game Changer in Next Generation Learning, where I basically put it to the students. I said, we're all working hard to try to create next generation learning infrastructures. But the truth is, the best of our policy and the best of our program and technology innovations are useless if students don't show up on purpose with a sense of tenacity and a sense of engagement. Are you with me on that? I think we have to actually set that expectation. If we are going to change the game, we have to set the expectation that students show up on purpose with a sense of tenacity and a sense of engagement. It's not about how entitled you are. It's are you willing to do the work to get ahead? And if they stand up to those responsibilities, then they should expect that we would do, will do the work to help think about a learning-centered, data-rich, high-value credential pathway for them on the other side. That should be the grand bargain. The grand bargain is you show up with purpose, tenacity, and engagement. We're going to focus on learning. We're going to make sure you're engaged. And we're going to make sure that you have a, you have a, a data-rich, high-value pathways you're coming to the other side. And by the way, we're going to, along the way, be very focused on this notion of deeper learning. And this notion of deeper learning, of critical learning, creative learning, social learning, and courageous learning matters big time. Why it matters big time? Just think about social learning. How do most people get their jobs after they get your, their credentials from your places? How do they get their jobs? Usually it's a social network, somebody who connects them into somebody else. Why are most people fired? Is it because of technical incompetence? Take out economic downturn. Why are most people terminated from their positions? Generally, it's because of interpersonal conflict. They can't get along with other people. In fact, the HR professionals have a joke for it. They call it the jerk effect. Either you're fired because you are a jerk or you're fired by a jerk. But there's always a jerk involved in the situation somewhere. <laughs> and in a radically complex social situation, which is where we are now, make no mistake about this, folks, we are in a radically complex social situation mediated by physical contact, social media, and a huge environment, and none of us have it figured out. We're all trying to figure out how this all works out. The social side really matters, and the courageous learning side desperately matters. The courageous learning is, do you have the courage to learn something new? In fact, one of my favorite lines from neuroscience right now is this idea that if you want to stave off Alzheimer's and dementia, keep neuroplasticity at its highest, keep your brain working at its best functionality, you want to be a rookie every year. You want to try something that stretches you out of your comfort zone because there's something healthy about that rookie experience. Which comes down to this, this wonderful quote from Eric Hoffer, the longshoreman philosopher from the 20th century. He said, in times of drastic change, it is the learners who inherit the future. The learned usually find themselves equipped to live in a world that no longer exists. Okay. So folks, there is so much to talk about. And what I hope is that you'll take the time to understand that, of course, we're a bit uncomfortable about this because it feels different. But it's worth the time to dive into these conversations about whether or not learning's happening, who the learners are, what kind of credential pathway they're gonna go on, how we're gonna leverage technology, and how this mix is gonna come together. Absolutely worth it. And if you're gonna dive into this conversation, two final ideas. One is if you're gonna dive into this conversation, buckle up, because as you dive, drive this conversation, two groups of loud voices will come out, and they'll come out loud and proud. One group I like to call the caustic cynics, 
Caustic cynics are against everything. It doesn't matter what you're talking about. You bring manna from heaven, it's too salty for them, and they're mad, right? A friend of mine calls them cave people. Colleagues against virtually everything. Yeah. <laughs> How many of you can think of a cave person somewhere in your world? And if you can't think of the cave person, you might be <laughs> just pointing that out. <laughs> they're only equaled, and they are equaled by true believers. The true believers will overpromise and underdeliver and will cut the credibility out of all your initiatives. But if they're into online learning, everybody should be doing online learning and they should see any value in anything else. And part of our challenge is most of these robust, important conversations get hijacked by the do well, dogmatic diatribes of either side. And everyday people who are just working hard walk up to that and go, <laughs> I'm going back to work. Right? They just don't want to deal with it because often those sides are bullies. The only way we're going to take this on and really wrestle with the challenges of post-secondary education and things the minister was talking about and creating a dynamic ecosystem is you've got to have the courage to step into it and, and calm down the caustic cynics, temper the true believers, and create a space for this kind of change. And then remember a final idea. <clears throat> when I was doing some work in Singapore, I had a really interesting experience. I was working with the Polytechnics in the University of Singapore. And when you travel in Singapore and you look like I do, you kind of stand out just a little bit. And this is an interesting experience because of where I live now, which is in Texas. I, I'm in the airport and across the, I'm in this weird feeling that everybody's looking at me. I mean, they're cutting glances and doing, I'm trying to figure out why they're all staring at me. And then I kind of get it. Across the airport for me is a guy who is clearly from Texas. I know he's from Texas because he's about 6'6", six, six, big cowboy head on, giant belt buckle, and he's telling everybody, I'm from Texas, and he's throwing stuff around all over the place. And he's out of control, yelling at everybody in his wake. His wife is busy apologizing to everybody in his wake. And um, what was funny about it is I, I kind of, I'm like, then I'm trying to figure out why everyone's looking at me. Then I get it. I'm the only other guy in the airport who looks like him. They all think I'm with him. So they're all staring at me too. And I finally decided to get away from him. And I get away from him. And about 20 minutes later, I'm going down to the ticket counter to get in line at Singapore Airlines. Singapore Airlines, by the way, phenomenal airline. Love it. I got in line, and I'm five people now behind this guy. And he is now in front of this four foot 11 Japanese woman just chewing her out. American Airlines, this would never happen. And he's screaming and he's yelling and it's just going bananas. And people beside me are going, can you do anything with him? I'm like, I don't know who he is. And, and he's going nuts, screaming at the top of his lungs. And what amazed me was not him though. I've seen people like him before at airports. What amazed me was her. Four foot 11 Japanese woman who is in complete control of the situation. She hasn't raised her voice, she hasn't called for help, hasn't flipped her hair, anything. She's just, the louder he talks, the softer she talks. And he's going crazier and crazier and she's just more and more in control. It's like watching a Zen master at work. <laughs> and finally, after about 10 minutes of absolute insanity, he just kind of loses steam and he gets on his way. And I get up there a few people later and I don't know why I feel the need to do it on behalf of all America. I am so sorry, you know we're not like that. <laughs> And she was laughing and I was laughing. I'm like, but I got to tell you, I don't know what kind of training you have at Singapore Airlines. That was pretty stunning. She goes, it's not training. And I go, what do you mean? She goes, she goes I'm Japanese. And I go, okay. She goes, we understand bachi. And I said, bachi. She goes, it's like your karma, which I thought's funny because karma's American. Not, I mean, so karma's Indian, not American. So I, I kind of, she goes, for example, I go, yeah. She goes, today that man is flying to Columbia, South Carolina. I said, okay. She goes, but now his bags are flying to Columbia, South America. <laughs> <laughs> she said, that's bocce, <laughs> which is basically the spirit you get in will be the spirit you get out. <laughs> Folks, there are millions of people in Ontario that are striving on post-secondary pathways, that have the doorway to opportunity within reach, who need your help who need you to have the courage to have the conversations to clear the pathway so that they're willing to do the work, that there is a clear and productive way for them to get across the stage. Thanks, folks.